Yes, okay, so um, what I wanted to do here is, um, this, uh, this is a sound that I'm going to be using in the performance this evening, um, one that I designed just specifically for, for interesting, um, uh, some live performance manipulations. Uh, it's a really simple structure, uh, there's nothing too complicated, but what makes it very interesting and very Egan Matrix-like is the positioning of the yellow dots in this diagram. So the, what the diagram shows is three modules uh, that are in the Egan Matrix on the far left and we've, the signal will fo flow generally from left to right. We have a white noise generator. Um, the white noise generator is connected to a low-pass filter, uh, which is going to be set in some pretty simple settings. Um, the amount of that white noise generator is rep going into the low-pass filter is represented by one of those yellow dots, so it's being intercepted by the yellow dot. There's another yellow dot that is connecting the white noise generator directly to this module called the BIC mode, which is a series of um, uh, bandpass filters that we use, um, it's typically used to generate sort of plucked stringed um, resonant type sounds. Uh, there's a yellow dot that's in there, so the, when the yellow dot represents more interference from the continuum playing surface and the player uh, into what ha goes from the white noise into the BIC mode. Um, the output from that previously mentioned low-pass filter also goes into the BIC mode, so they are simply summed together and go to the input. And then there's a single lonely yellow dot in the BIC mode which is um, representing all the various controls that we have um, that you can change for that particular part of the EGA matrix. Ega matrix. All right, so remember the diagram? Very straightforward, white noise into BIC mode, white noise into low pass filter into BIC mode. So in the Ega matrix, that's represented slightly differently since we have essentially a pin matrix where all the sources are on the left hand side and all the destinations are on the top. And so you do an intersect to get, connect a row with a column. So if we look at this noise here, going into the BIC mode, this point right there, that is the connection between the unfiltered noise going into the BIC no mode and um, that yellow dot is now formula B. So formula B is the amount of audio level from the noise that's feeding into the BIC mode. And so what's going to happen typically when you use these things, you use them in a highly resonant fashion. So it doesn't take very much energy to uh, excite them because all this energy is going to be, is going to go into these feedback loops and um, create this resonant type of sound. Um, before I go any further, I'll just play this sound so you can sort of hear what its characteristic. Can I have just a, a bit more volume, Eric? is that noise going in 
being shaped by a shape generator. Um, and that's one half of the noise component that's controlling the bit mode. Um, the other half is if you look at the noise here and follow it along its output, you can see that it's going into a low pass filter. And this low pass filter um, is then set, it's, it's a very simple single pole low pass that's 6 dB per octave. There's no um, resonance setting for this particular filter. And what I've done here is set it to a fixed frequency. So I put a four from a direct column a row into the frequency column for the low pass filter. And the four, since this value is in kilohertz, that represents four kilohertz. So the filter is simply um, just static constant at four kilohertz. The level of the noise going in is also a constant because I'm going to shape it after the fact. And this is a case where I had put in a numeric value here and then realized it was too, too much energy, so I attenuated it by multiplying. So we have this special row on the very bottom of the Ega matrix, and there's a multipl multiplication symbol here. So what this does, it will take the um, summation of all the other uh, row components and then multiplying by this number. So it's, it's very useful for um, uh, scaling a, a whole series of um, formulas. Like if you had, had stacked in to the input of the filter six different things and you realized, oh, now it's, I'm, it's just too much energy or it's not, not enough, I need to make a grand adjustment to this ent entire thing. Rather than going in and changing every single formula, it's easy enough just to put a multiplier in here. So when I multiply by 0 0.04, that 0.5 now becomes a, uh, like a 0 0.02. So I could replace this and this number, remove that number, put a 0.02, it would be exactly the same thing. So that's the filter. And then the output of the filter, which is oscillator filter number five, so we can find it on this side here. So here's number five. Here's the row that goes across. And then we can see that now it's going also into the input to the BIC mode. So we have this continuous noise source that's been filtered. And then we also have that's going into the input. And then we also here have this um, noise. We have this noise source that's being shaped by a little tick of sound from this uh, shape generator. So those two noise inputs are summed, and, uh, but they will have different characteristics. So in this sound, what I'm when you hear sustained notes, or a plucked note, we just hear essentially the energy coming from formula B into the BIC mode, because there's just not enough um, time for the uh, sustained energy to come through. If we go over here and look at M, which is now this sustain portion, I'm not using any sort of shape generator. All I'm using is my finger pressure. And so when the key, when you're not touching it, or if you're, you know, just really close to the surface, it's at zero, and then it will follow up in a squared function to a maximum of 0.25. So effectively, what it means is when I play, I get this sustained portion. So, and what I found was that when it was sustaining, it was musically more interesting to have the high frequency components attenuated. If you wanted to make adjustments to that, let's just experiment. It's subtle, but it's it's there. It's something that um, worked within the sound. I'll go back to um, so that's the that's the oh sorry that that's the two inputs into this big boat. So that's that's the kind of thing that is the energy source. Um, uh, for the BIC mode. If you're using the BIC mode, 
uh, for um, uh, um, excite, exciting something that's kind of resonating in pitch. You want to make kind of a pitched instrument. Noise is a good choice because it's pitch agnostic, typically, and you can sort of shape it, and it will give you, do doesn't matter what uh, harmonics are that you're exciting, it's, it's, it's going to give you an even playing field. That, you know, not, that's not to say you can't use this to act as specific resonators and give them pitched information. That can be a very, very interesting thing to do, too. So if we look at these two formulas, they're being added together, going into the BIC mode. And then I have another multiplier here. How am I for time, Christoph? So I know I was late, eh? I'm almost done, eh? I'll go, go a little bit over. Okay, so, so this is, this is going to multiply. So here, wh what I found is they just don't need um, as much energy in the higher frequencies as you do in the lower frequencies to make something sound <coughs> even as compared to up here. So now I have this big scalar that I've put. So I, I have a constant. W, which is a 1, and then I'm scaling the, um, the level. So this is multiplying. So again, this is really useful. I have these two formulas. I, I like the relationship together, like in, in middle C, but now I'm just finding I have this misbalance within the, uh, the range of the continuum. <coughs> See, it's overloading up there. So it's well, it there too, but it's, it's scaling it, it, it quite a bit. It's mainly the relationship down there that you get. So, and here it's just doing this thing from C2 to C8. And so, um, it, it's, um, so which you're getting a value of uh, 0.5. Uh, let's turn this on. You can see down here, down at C2, it's just about 0.5. And then as I go up, it's scaling it down. You have to point 0.5. What happens often, uh, you know, w w might get a little breakup like that, is this sound is not a, fact, a system preset, so I haven't like bashed on it and given it all the worst case scenarios. What if someone does this type of thing? Because I know, okay, I'm I'm actually not playing up there for the for the performance. So, so anyway, that's um, that's the scalar. So th again, another useful thing for using this multiply column. end up using it quite often. Um, all right, so what was my next step? Yes. Okay. So let's go back to B. Uh, how much time do you want me to take, Christoph? Five minutes. Five minutes, okay. So I'll go back to B. What, what we do is um, we have um, this shape generator. So you see it's a um, pulse wave, which gives just give a little blip. And here's the shape generator settings. It's at a frequency of 5, so 5 cycles per second. Um, and then W is triggering it, so it's really simple. Just when I hit my finger, the shape generator kicks in. Um, and I've set it to single cycle, so it's not going to keep repeating. So otherwise, if I had had it on continuous, you get this sort of effect completely dependent on this speed setting. And here's another thing to remember. If you do trigger them this way, notice as it gets slower, well, the, pu the pulse isn't a, f a fixed size. It's a relationship. It's a duty cycle part of that pulse wave. So as you increase it, it's less, and it, the sound starts to get a little sharper. So you can use that to your advantage. Let's, let's go through the BIC mode here, and I'll go through quickly. Um, so frequency. This is the uh, frequency of the first mode, and then all the harmonics follow it. Um, simply put an X in here, and now you've got this classic um, temper, um, you know, pitch, 440, 220, 110 here. Um, I'll go into the spread of the frequencies. These spread of the frequencies, what I did was... Um, um, I'm using all 48 
of the modes uh, in the graph. You have a choice between using either 8 or 48, but I'm using 48 here. Um, and that, that relationship here is of these frequencies is specified. Well, these are showing the amplitudes here. And the, the, the relationship is shown here. And typically, if you, if you put a 1 in there, you're going to get a harmonic relationship. But I wanted something that it was almost like this was a little bit of a wooden gamelon set, and I had different ones that were in different ranges. So the tone actually changes, and you hear it. Hear that little jump? There. And so look at the form, the numeric value and below the G. And that's the frequency spread of the harmonics. Now, what, now I actually realize this is, in the strict design of this thing, that's kind of a mistake. I, I don't want it to jump because I'm, I'm trying to imitate something that's acoustic and that's not a very acoustic um, capability. So what you can't, I should have done here is instead of continuously reading X value as it changed, I should have put it to initial. So now it's going to pick that initial relationship and not jump. It'll just stick with it until you hit it again. But again, it wasn't, uh, I had not noticed it until I was preparing for this talk, so. It's just one of those things, and if I put this in the system presets, I, I, may, I may change that um, thing. So it just made, what I found was I found the harmonics more interesting was lower and higher, and um, so that was, and that, that's not a decision of math, that's a decision of listening. Where the sound gets interesting here is the, um, uh, I have this blend control, which is controlling the bandwidth, and the bandwidth is the amount of ring. It's the amount of, uh, that's how narrow that bike quad is, the narrower it is, the more the energy is going to concentrate, the more it's going to recycle and you'll hear it. So you have a sound with a wider bandwidth, but as you take, open it up, you get this nice ringing bell-like characteristic that I've put under pedal control. Okay, then we have a, um, a, a um, essentially a spread of the amplitudes of the bandwidth and that was just controlled, um, uh, I'm sorry, of the, uh, yeah, the bandwidth and I just wanted to change differences, slight differences between Y. Uh, in the BIC mode graph we have ways of modifying these. Uh, I have one that's, mod this, this scaled offset is mod modifying frequency um, and then uh, this one is modifying amplitude. So I have two different settings, and then you put formulas in here to express the relationship between pure this and then what this does. Yeah, to clarify, he, when he says modifying frequency, it's the frequency of each resonance of the instrument, as opposed to the, the fundamental is always the same, but the uh, is changing the, yeah. the uh, harmonics. So I just wanted a very slight change in here between the two ends of Y. Not to really, it would, it's almost like, it's so subtle it just ends up being this kind of, it, depending on how you're playing, it's just this random thing you don't consciously try to control. And the other one here is, um, is, is an amplitude, and so notice that the number is getting higher, so as we get up to C8, it's going to go closer to full in, impact of the graph. Okay, so, so what we can deduce here is that we have a certain uh, amplitude of uh, harmonics here and as the sound uh, goes up higher we're going to attenuate two and four and uh, generally start to attenuate all the higher frequencies. So it'll, it's again another way of getting timbre change and I've mapped that timbre change just according to X position. Okay, just to wrap up because I know we're, we're short. What is interesting with this sound is I also set up another shape generator to create echoes. And so you can play this thing and notice that my, all my amplitude control is in here. So I'm putting all my shaping into the front and then in the, on the rear end as, as the BIC mode comes out into the mixer, it's just a one, it's just passing everything. So I can create these kind of recycling trigger points in the front, which sounds like multiple strikes. So 
So it's almost like you created echoes, but it's not echoes, it's actually just, imagine little gremlins continuing to <laughs> restrike the uh, instrument at your <laughs> beck and command. And it's really beautiful um, when you turn the muting off because you get this nice sustained cloud of Or another way that I've worked with, and it's completely arbitrary because of this quantization I did with the energy going from the shape generator, you can just pedal off and get this sustain ring or attenuate it with the mute. So I'll use those tricks in the piece that I'm performing. Any questions? Is that Philip? Uh, could, would it be possible to continuously change the timbre of the sound, like let's say, like from a bell to a string or something like that, uh, with this kind of synth, synth engine? Yes, yes, you could. What you would do is, if you know, like in this particular example, it's not very evident, but um, uh, let's see. This is not uh, very much like a, um, uh, a string characteristic, but a sustained characteristic. This is almost like a, a bowed vibraphone or something like that. But it's just, in, in this case, I could have set this up so that if I strike it, I get this bell sound, and then if I play continuously, I could get a sustained timbre. So it would, it would take um, a little bit of programming, say, what I typically do when I program is I specify, I say, oh, what I want to do is I want to make something that sound. I'm going to try to make a bowed bo gong. That's my uh, goal, let's say. And then I start designing towards it, and I never want to achieve my goal. What I want to do is, on that path, I want to discover what the continuum will allow me to do. So if, if I wanted to change from a string, uh, let's say from a guitar to a string texture by playing it, I would have that in my mind, and then I might end up with, well, no, that's more of a koto to a flute or something, you know. But I would be happy with the result because it was that discovery along the path. Mm -hmm. yeah. Clifton? I have a question. What's the difference between on the direct, on the top edition where you have the three, and then the one beneath it with the formula E? The difference between those two? Two pluses? Yes. Nothing. It's just me, uh, that's just a way of, to easy add. So I could have, um, there's, you know, th this is getting to the point where we, there's multiple ways of doing things. We try to um, not put too many in, but there's, there are different ways. Sometimes you just want to do something simple. You just want to add two things, and that happens quite a bit. So we, that's why we made it. And, um, uh, but yeah, there's, uh, they're, they're, they act ex exactly the same. And of course, the negative is just the inverted uh, one. Ah. I was curious, yeah. is there any difference between those two? But no, no, they're exactly the same. Okay. Okay, so thank okay. you very much, Ed. So, yeah. Sorry for giving you a special time on this topic.